So welcome. Today's topic is summer blooming bulbs, and it's just a little bit of fancy for your garden. I absolutely love summer blooming bulbs. They're wonderful, and they do so much for us. So just a note that I might use these two terms interchangeably. So if I say spring planted bulbs, that means that they're going to be bulbs that bloom in the summertime. This is different than our fall planted bulbs, which are blooming now. So fall planted bulbs include daffodils and crocus and tulips, but our summer planted or our spring planted, our summer blooming spring planted is dahlias and gladiolas and some of those other plants that we see later on in the summer. So just know that I'm going to be using those terms interchangeably. So moving right in and what the general topic and the agenda is for today is I'm going to introduce bulbs as a whole. Then we'll talk about how you can incorporate them into your garden and the cultural care that they need. We'll then go into specific types of uh, summer blooming bulbs that you could consider planting. And then we'll wrap up the presentation with how to store them for the winter. Simply because for the most part, these are not hardy bulbs to Colorado and so they do need to be dug there's a little bit of extra care that's involved. So a bulb is just a general term, but bulb just means that it's a group of plants that have underground food storage organs. One of our famous ones that will be blooming soon are iris. Those are actually rhizomes. But when we're talking about summer blooming bulbs, we have our true bulbs like lilies. Uh, tubers include dahlias and caladiums. And of course the famous tuber that we eat is the potato. Uh, rhizomes are cannas and then corms are gladiolus. So these are all underground rooting or storage organs, but I'm just calling them bulbs as a collective group. For the most part, our summer blooming bulbs are not considered to be hardy and they have to be dug up, which we'll get into at the end of the presentation. The great thing is, is that these plants are really tropical looking and can really add a lot of pomp and circumstance to your garden. So these are what you'll be planting sometime soon in the next few weeks. And these, they're not attractive, you know, but that's okay. But this is just an example of what they've looked like. You've probably planted something similar if you put any sort of fall blooming bulbs into your, or fall planted bulbs into your garden. But what they turn into is absolutely outstanding. So tuberous begonias are all sorts of beautiful. Crocosmia, we're not covering that today, but just know that's another option. We will talk about the lilies. Of course, the poster child of summer blooming bulbs is the dahlia, and we'll get into all of these. So just know that those little tiny storage organs, those tubers, those corms turn into these beautiful flowers sometime in the middle of the summer. When you go to purchase, if you want to pick your own, going through a mail order catalog or online is really your best selection. Now there will be bulbs available from our local garden centers. I was at one fairly recently and they had a fairly large display. But if you're on a mission to find something specific, it is probably better to go with some of the bigger mail order catalogs or just shop online. The earlier you order, the better off you're going to be. Uh, I was just perusing a Dahlia catalog not too long ago and a lot of their bulbs are already sold out. So that is something, but if you're just dipping a toe into this or you've never planted before, a lot of the more common varieties are perfectly fine and they're going to be absolutely beautiful. But if you get a bug and you become a little bit more sophisticated, you might be seeking some of those specific varieties. For the most part, our companies who are shipping via online are not going to ship them to you until your climate is ready. So in Colorado, that can really vary. Here in the Front Range, we're getting into spring, but we're still a little bit too chilly to get some of these bulbs in the ground. If you're higher in elevation, you might need to wait even longer. So the companies are good about making sure they don't ship them too early so that you don't get too anxious and then have issues later on. If you buy from a local garden center, the benefit is, is that you get to pick out the individual bulbs. So you can pick out the biggest ones because the biggest bulbs are going to have the most flowers. You can also avoid those that are mushy or discolored or soft. This generally means there was some sort of issue during the storage process and they're not going to be as desirable or they could be rotting. Uh, so you can also mix and match colors. So let's just say you want one dahlia and a handful of gladiola. You could do this as opposed to buying online where you're usually 
uh, required to buy a certain amount. So just know that it's up to you. Maybe start off by going to your garden center and seeing what they have available, and then you could supplement with online purchases. When you do get ready to plant, your site exposure is going to be important. For the most part, these are full sun plants. Okay, so they like hot, sunny locations, and they're going to do best if they at least have morning sun. If they get a little bit of afternoon shade, that's probably going to be fine because we all know in the summer months, our Colorado afternoons can get pretty scorching. So at least morning sun, but for the most part, six to eight hours is the minimum amount of sun they're going to need. And if you do have them like in a south facing or west facing landscape, sometimes those darker colors are going to fade. This is really only important if you are either growing them for a cut flower project or perhaps going to enter them into a county fair or a local society event. Uh, they do look at that. So some of the reds may get a little bit bleached. And if that's the case, you're going to need to employ methods of shading them in the afternoon. So if you've ever met a diehard dahlia grower, they have a steady supply of umbrellas on hand that they then attach to the stakes to help provide shade to the flowers to prevent them from getting bleached out. But if you're just growing them for your own enjoyment or to cut to bring into your house as a bouquet, that's generally not a huge concern. The soil needs to be well drained. So for the most part, these are not xeric plants. You can absolutely incorporate them, but make sure that you are placing them where they're going to get regular water. Containers are a great spot and all of the ones I'll talk about today can be grown in containers. But if you do, do, do decide to plant them in the ground, just know that they will need regular water. So moist, well-drained soil is ideal. You might consider getting a soil test just to know your baseline measurements. It's not absolutely essential if you have other plants growing in the area that are doing really well, especially flowering plants. For the most part, these are going to do well. Your organic matter in your soil should be somewhere around 5%, and that's where the soil test comes in handy. And you could consider adding some fertilizer at planting. It's not absolutely essential simply because those storage tubers, the organs themselves, have so many nutrients that they will have enough fertilizer and nutrients to actually produce the blooms for that year. But if you do plan on keeping them year after year, adding some fertilizer can benefit the bulb. So maybe some supplemental fertilizer, perhaps a half rate. You can use whatever you want. It can be organic, it can be synthetic, but something in the complete area, which means that it's just like a a number that's consistent, like a 10, 10, 10, or a 20, 20, 20. And for the most part, these would be slow release, a granular form that's incorporated when you plant. So consider doing that. The planting sequence is also going to be important. And this is where you really get to know your plant material. So if you've ever bought uh, spring blooming bulbs, the ones that are blooming now, and looked at daffodils, for example, if you look at the varieties of daffodils, you'll see that they'll bloom early, mid, or late spring. And this is the same thing that you'll want to think about with your summer blooming bulbs, is that some dahlias, some uh, gladiolas, they'll bloom earlier than others. And there are some, especially gladiolas, that you could actually plant in sequence. So just like your vegetable garden where you're planting beans every two weeks to make sure that you have a bean harvest over a period of time, you would do the same thing with some of these other uh, summer blooming bulbs. So gladiolas are a perfect example. You plant a few, two weeks later, plant a few more. Otherwise you'll have flowers that come on all at once. That's not a bad thing. Maybe you want a buku bumper crop of gladiolas for some sort of event, but if you do want to stretch that out, consider planting them. In other varieties, you'll just look at the timing of the planting and the flower sequence. So some dahlias will bloom earlier than others. The larger ones tend to bloom a little bit later, larger in terms of flower size, not necessarily the plant. As I mentioned, containers are great for all of these plants. So if you don't have space in your garden, you can really add a lot to your patio or your front porch by planting some of these in containers. So as long as the container is large enough to support the plant at maturity, and as long as the potting mix is well-drained, you can really plant all of these in containers. 
The one caveat is that if you do use containers, you must fertilize. And the reason for that is because you're watering your containers very frequently, sometimes once a day, maybe twice a day if it gets really hot. And every time you water, you're going to be leaching some of those nutrients away from the potting mix. So these plants will need supplemental fertilizer, supplemental nutrition in order to keep producing foliage and flowers. So I would recommend that you incorporate a type of slow release at planting and then supplement with a liquid feed, whatever you want, just mix it with your water um, when they start to flower and produce. That will help keep them going. When do you plant? Well, it's going to depend. So our best extension answer is it depends on when your soils are warm enough to sustain growth. So for the most part, if we do get some regular precipitation and looking at the forecast next week here in the front range, we hopefully will get some weather. It looks like there's going to be another potential snowstorm coming in and wet soils tend to be cold soils. So you do want the soils to be drier and you do want them to be warmer. So cold soils take a lot longer to warm up. And so that is something to consider. For the most part, these are tropical bulbs. And so they really need warmer soil temperatures of around 60 degrees. So when you get ready to plant, if you just have a thermometer on hand, something that can get into the 50, 60 degree range, stick it in the soil two inches deep in the morning and take your soil's temperature. It's kind of funny. We're used to taking our temperatures all the time, but you do need to take your soil's temperature. So growth will start when those soils are 60 degrees or warmer. Uh, you can plant before that, but you definitely don't want to plant when the soils are too wet because these bulbs are very prone to rotting. So you just, it's kind of that careful balance. So for the most part in the front range, waiting until May 1st, May 15th, somewhere around there is perfectly acceptable. Planting now might not be the best idea. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't mean they won't be successful, just know that they will take longer to push new growth if the soils are too cold. So let's go into what to plant, but I will take any questions if there are any right now, Cassie and Tony. I think we're good so far. Okay. Yep, okay, I will move on. So there is Maple the Beagle. If you followed anything I do on Instagram or any of our blogs, you will notice that Maple the Beagle is a huge point. Uh, this was when we first adopted Maple. She came out of a research facility and she was scared of everything. So the Dahlia tuber to her was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> she has since adjusted quite well. So Maple the Beagle was helping me plant some Dahlia tubers one year. So let's start it off with Dahlias because these are, again, the poster child of our summer blooming bulbs. Dahlias are amazing because they come in a huge range of flower color shape and size. So if you're looking for a huge flower, dahlias would be a perfect plant for you. They have some that reach six inches or bigger, and they also have these cute little pom-pom types that might get only an inch wide. So a lot of variation in color, textures, and all of those things. Dahlias are a wonderful plant, and they're not hard to grow. I think there might be a general opinion out there that dahlias are really difficult, and truthfully, they're not. I can grow them. So I love teaching about gardening, and I will be the first person to admit that I am not the world's best gardener. So dahlias can have a lot of success. The one thing is, is that they will need to be staked unless you are growing some of the shorter cultivars. So when you purchase them, if you're not into staking or you don't want that additional maintenance, buy ones that are going to be less than two feet tall. Anything taller than that, especially with our winds that we get, are prone to breaking. You will plant the dahlia tubers on their side. So you're gonna plant them flat, about four to six inches deep. And then depending on what you're growing, the larger ones will need to be about three feet apart, while the smaller ones could be somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 to 24 inches apart. So again, keep track of what you're growing. All of the tubers that you get should be stamped with the name, which is really helpful. And then you can cross-reference how big they get. So you're going to dig a trench just like you would if you were going to plant peas or potatoes or anything else like that. Remember though, it just needs to be four to six inches deep. 
and you're going to lay those tubers down on their side and space them accordingly. For the dahlias, you don't need to water them until you start seeing growth coming out of the soil. So it's very weird because we've always been trained to water in every plant that we put in the ground. But in the case of dahlias, we do want to be careful not to water too much because again, soggy soils can lead to rot and other bad conditions. So plant them, cover them up, and then wait to water until you start to see new growth. Using wood mulch around your plants is going to be beneficial, cuts down on weeds, it's going to help with water conservation, uh, and those will all work um, really well. You can use whatever mulch you have. You can use wood mulch, you can use grass clippings, you could use leaves. I probably wouldn't put them in rock because it might get just a little bit too hot. For staking, if you're planting those larger varieties, you'll want to stake at planting. So as soon as you put the tuber in the ground, put a stake about six inches away from it. Uh, if you cover them up and then you decide to stake after the fact, you might stab your tuber, which is not a good idea. So do put that stake. There's lots of different stakes that you could use. In this case, they're using just a piece of rebar, but there are so many staking options. And this is obviously a very fancy dahlia grower because you can see they've also employed the use of the umbrellas to protect the flowers from getting too hot. Uh, but just know that staking, it's just like tomatoes. There's so many different choices out there. Find one that works for you. As the plants start to grow, and if you're producing them for flowers, you will want to disbud some of those uh, buds adjacent to the main bud. Uh, what this does is that if you leave all of the buds on a plant, you're going to have more flowers, but they're going to be smaller. And maybe that's okay with you. But if you're looking for a single flower on a nice long stem, you're going to want to go in and take off those side buds. It's again, it's totally up to you, depends on what you're doing. If you're growing them for cut flowers, obviously having a single flower on a long stem is desirable. If you're just bringing them inside or enjoying them in the garden, you don't necessarily have to do this step. If you do wanna put dahlias in containers, again, they're going to do really well. It's going to need to be a larger container, at least 12 by 12, and I would say at least 12 inches deep. So 12 by 12 by 12, that's quite a bit of uh, area for the plants to root. Also, you would just want to do one tuber per, per container. So it's a lot of real estate to just have one plant in a container, but that's what's going to be ideal for these plants simply because they do get quite big. You also will want to stake them in your containers just because they are prone to tipping over. Plant them in containers after the threat of frost. So here the, the recommendation is mid-May. You know, we've had so many snows on Mother's Day that that date is really just a wild card. So you might even wait till Memorial Day weekend to put these in the ground. Don't worry about missing a week or 10 days or two weeks. Uh, they will grow and they will catch up and the soils will be warmer and the temperatures will be a little bit better for growth as well. So the same principles planted about four to six inches deep, one tuber per container and then cover it with potting mix and you can then start to water and fertilize appropriately. Uh, make sure that again, you're not watering too much after it's planted because you could waterlog it and cause rot. Just a couple of dahlias that you can consider growing. These are the types and you can find a ton of information online. There's a couple of really amazing dahlia growers in the United States. So the dinner plate dahlias are bigger than eight inches. These are all you need is one for your container, for your vase, and it would be absolutely beautiful. And there's just some varieties. There's so many more, I just picked a few. The decorative dahlias are anywhere from four to eight inches, and you can see how many petals there are per flower. Now there are ones that are a single flower color like this that are just white. There are some that are bi-colored. Uh, just know that again, dahlias have a great variation. The cactus and semi-cactus are a little bit more spiky um, than the ones we just looked at. This is Karma Corona. So again, a beautiful flower. And what's nice about dahlias is that a lot of times the colors are going to change as the flower matures. You may have seen this on some of your roses or other perennials, 
but it is really nice where that pink might start like a dark magenta and then fade to more of a lighter pink as the plant matures and the flower opens. The ball and the pom-pom dahlias are my absolute favorite because they're so tightly compact and those petals are all packed together in this beautiful little one and they have ones that look like tiny little golf balls that are so cute to add to your cut flower arrangements. They also last a really long time too. So they're perfectly round, just a honeycomb of color. This is Boom Boom Red. Um, if you're watching the Masters, of course, you know that Freddie Couples is nicknamed Boom Boom. Uh, so that's why I put that one in there because I love Freddie Couples. The water lily dahlias are going to be flat on the bottom. So if you've ever seen a dahlia floating in a dish of water, it's actually a special dahlia that you'd want to grow called the water lily type. So the bottoms are flat and then to display it, you would cut it really short. The stem would be cut very short and then you would display it in a shallow dish. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant and these will last for at least a week in water if you change uh, the water frequently, but they're so beautiful and that bicolor of the pink and yellow, or pink and yellow, pink and white uh, really is beautiful. If you're looking for a plant that's more pollinator friendly, and it's not that dahlias aren't pollinator friendly, but if you remember some of the ones we looked at and how tightly clustered those petals are, sometimes it's difficult for pollinators to get into them. So if you'd like to have dahlias but are more interested in attracting pollinators, then consider planting some of the single petal types. So this is an example where you can see the pollinator parts are right there and exposed. So HS means happy single flame. That's the one featured here. There's a whole series of single dahlias. And there was one that was actually selected as one of the best dahlias from the CSU trials last year that was noted to have a ton of pollinator activity. So this is a little bit more daisy-like. And again, it just depends on your personal preference. We'll move into cannas, and cannas are, I think, one of my favorites. So I Can I ask one question on that? Yes, yes. Of course, um, sorry, Cassie, I should have asked. Not a problem. That's why I just interrupted. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you're growing dahlias in containers, about how many seasons can you reasonably expect to get out of one tuber? So if you're overwintering them properly, so they would have the same overwintering treatment, you could, with proper care, get at least two or three seasons out of them. Now, I have never done that, and so if someone wants to chat with you, if they've had other experience, but I can't see why they would be different if they're getting the proper care and then the correct storage as well. Okay. All right, so cannas are an amazing foliage plant. So I absolutely adore plants that we just grow for their foliage. So uh, coleus and cannas and some of those, I just think they're so neat because they have this incredible variegation in their foliage. So this is one that if you're following the rules of container plants, the filler, spiller, thriller, this would be your thriller. This is the guy that you put in the back or in the center that is the showpiece of your container. They're very tall. The flowers are incredibly tropical looking, but what's nice is that the flowers are great, but again, you have that foliage texture and color all year round as well. They're really good for water gardens or ponds, and so these are plants that you can actually sink directly into a pond and have them grow so they can grow in water, which is really amazing if you think about the diversity uh, in these plants. These are rhizomes, and so you would plant the rhizomes about six inches deep and eight inches apart. And then if you're planting in a container, just like the rules with the dahlia, you would want to do only one rhizome per container, unless it's an enormous container then you can maybe get away with two or three. They don't usually require staking, which is nice, but you do want to keep them out of any sort of wind gusty areas because the foliage, because it's so wide and so large, it can easily become tattered. So that is kind of a downside. So it depends on your landscape and how your backyard is positioned, but just know that uh, protecting them a little bit from the wind is going to be a good idea. 
So a couple photos of the amazing variegation. I absolutely love this one in the top right because I could see it pictured, especially like on an Eastern exposure with the sunlight coming through to backlight it. I think that would be absolutely beautiful. They do have some that are just green leaves too. So if you're not digging the variegation or you just want something that's a little bit more solid color, they have some that are green or burgundy as well. So huge, huge variation in those. Um, there's a lot of canna cultivars out there. These are just some of the ones that I found that seem to be readily available and a little bit more common. And don't feel like you need to frantically write this down. Again, I will send you the slides. You will have all of this information that you can then access later. A couple others, Black Knight. If you're looking for a plant that really has that very, very dark, darker than burgundy colored foliage, that would be a good one. The flower is red, so you would need to pair that accordingly. But I mean, if you're not drooling over Cleopatra, then oh my goodness, it's just amazing. And if you want to pair this in containers, just pull out any of those colors. So you could do an all green container, or you could just pair it with whites or other neutrals to really help accent that. Or you go on the color palette and you see what the complementary colors are and the ones that would also look good. So Cleopatra, I mean, she's a showstopper right there. Okay, I'm gonna move on to lilies unless there's questions about cannas. Okay, I'll move on. So lilies are one of the ones that are going to be hardy. So if you do plant lilies into your garden, you don't have to overwinter them indoors, which is really, really nice. So only plants in the Lilium genus are true lilies. So obviously we have daylilies that we plant a lot. It's in, it's a, in the Liliaceae family, but it's actually a different genus. So the Lilium genus is specific for the lilies. And we just saw an onslaught of, of course, Easter lilies, uh, which for the most part are not very hardy in Colorado, but that is a true lily that we see as well. Lilies are very classic. I think everybody is familiar with a lily shaped flower. They're very, very showy. They tend to be, um, co they come in a variation of colors, which is nice. And then the petals themselves can either be a little bit more upright or they can completely reflex back, such as the Turk's cap, which I'll show you an example of. Um, the flowers may nod down, they may nod up, they may look up, and so they're kind of a character in the garden, and they're really a nice addition uh, because they have such warm colors. So a lot of them are oranges and yellows, quite a few whites, um, but then we do have some pinks as well. So they're very much a significant part of the landscape once they're in bloom. If you're looking to plant lilies, these are ones that need full sun. So keep that in mind, just like most of the ones we've talked about today. The larger bulbs will be planted four to six inches deep, and then the smaller lilies will be planted two to four inches deep. And you can plant these as soon as you can work the soil in the spring. So if you have a gap this weekend, if you're out and about and you run into some lilies, you could actually get these in the ground. They're not nearly as sensitive to the cold soils or to wet soils as our dahlias are. So just be aware of that because they're a pretty hardy plant. For the best garden show, you'll want to plant, plant them in groups or we call this en masse. So at least three bulbs together, five, seven, nine, odd numbers tend to look a bit better to the design eye, uh, but do plant at least a few of them together for the most impact. Just having one lily here or there doesn't give you as big of a show. And then you can space those groups three to five feet apart. So you could plant three bulbs together in one area, move three feet away in the garden, plant another group of three bulbs and continue that pattern. And that will give you quite an impact. The container grown lilies, you can again plant these in a container. You can plant those any time during the growing season. So this is again one that you could plant this weekend with some warmer weather. Just keep in mind that watering um, and not watering too much until you start to see growth because you don't want them to get too wet. The types of lilies that we have, again, these are reliable perennials. So these will be coming back year after year. They do probably need some heavy mulching in the fall, but they should be hardy enough to survive most of our winters. So let's go through the three different types of lilies that you might find in the garden. 
Asiatic lilies are very easy to grow. And if you're just going to, you know, start growing lilies for the first time this year, I would recommend that you do the Asiatic types. They're really tolerant. They're not picky of soils and they'll do fine in most any soils as long as there's good drainage. So this is not one for the compacted part of the garden. Um, but if, again, if you have an area that's growing perennials well, you could add some lilies to that area and they will have good success. The nice thing is, is that you don't need to stake them. So again, if you're not interested in doing that extra step of staking, the Asiatic lilies don't need to be staked. And they also have the widest range of colors. So they usually have more than one color on their petals themselves. They usually have dark flecks or dark spots, which you can see here. Um, those actually help lead pollinators down into the places where they need to pollinate, which is kind of fun. It's almost like a landing strip in some cases. And our Asiatic lilies are among the first to bloom. So we'll generally start seeing our Asiatic lilies blooming sometime, depending on the year, end of June into July, somewhere around there. The downside is, is that there's no fragrance with these. So if you're familiar with the Easter lilies where they have this really intoxicating fragrance, maybe you don't like it so much, uh, just know that the Asiatic types do not have a fragrance associated with them. A couple of very reliable, easy to find cultivars would be Connecticut King. That is the one in the top right, the yellow one, very reliable, blooms about three to four feet. Uh, the height is three to four feet and it will bloom in June-ish. So usually around the end of June. If you want something that's a little more pink, Crete is going to be a good option and it's going to bloom after the Connecticut King. So in June or into July, generally. So those are two Asiatic lily types that would do well in your garden. And if you're joining us from somewhere that's not the front range, I would say that these are zone five plants. And so if you're higher in elevation, uh, you could always try it. You could always grow them as annuals. That's an option. Um, but if you do want to consider overwintering, then uh, make sure that you're mulching them really, really well in the fall. The oriental lilies are becoming a lot more popular. So these are often taller, up to six feet tall. If it's a windy site, I would consider staking these. So again, the um, Asiatic lilies only get to be about three to four feet tall and the oriental lilies can be up to six feet tall, which is a huge plant if you think about it. I mean, that's really, really tall. Uh, they'll start blooming after the Asiatic lilies bloom. So a nice thing to consider is again, if you want that sequence of blooms, plant some Asiatic lilies, plant some Oriental lilies so that you have multiple weeks of lily bloom, which is nice. They will perform best when protected from hot afternoon sun. So this would be one that really is more ideal for an east facing exposure. And if you do have them in a west or a south facing, they would prefer some shade. So maybe under a tree that gives dappled shade, you know, I'm trying to envision what your gardens look like and there might not be a perfect spot for it, but just know that they will do best with uh, protection from the hot afternoon sun. They are heavily scented. So this is the one that you're probably most familiar with and they're not quite as hardy either. So even in the front range, we might have winters that are just too cold or too dry that will kill the oriental lilies. So um, if you do grow them, mulch them really, really well. A couple cultivars to consider, Black Beauty and Stargazer. Uh, Stargazer, you've probably heard of. If you've read the book, Flower Confidential, really interesting book about the cut flower industry. Um, you'll know that Stargazer was actually developed by a professor at Iowa State. I went there, so I'm really proud of that. Uh, but Stargazer was his lifelong project and it's a really interesting story. Uh, but Stargazer is probably the classic oriental lily that we usually see. Uh, Black Beauty is a close cousin um, and just has slightly different coloring to it. Um, Stargazer is a little bit shorter, which is really nice. So you likely don't need to stake and it blooms in August. So again, you could time these where they could bloom starting in late June through July and then into August. And the final lily is Turk's Cap. Uh, these are interesting. Um, their petals are completely reflexed backwards, which is really kind of fun. They're a very, very distinct plant. 
into the garden. Um, the flowers are usually yellow orange, pure yellow. They might be white or burgundy. Uh, they also have the flecking that's very common on some of our lilies. They're on very, very tall plants, up to seven feet tall. So another one that needs staking and they'll bloom a little bit earlier. So they'll bloom usually between the Asiatic and the Oriental lilies, somewhere in that neighborhood, but they're just so distinct, but they're very tall plants and can really become a focal point in the landscape. Any questions on lilies, Cassie, Tony? Oh, good. Okay. So gladiolus is probably, oh, I love dahlias. I love all of these, but gladiolus to me is an old fashioned flower and it brings back memories of my childhood. My mom was close friends with an older gentleman and he had a beautiful garden in Minnesota and he grew rows and rows and rows of gladiolus. And my mom would come home with bouquets from him every summer and I just loved it. He was a wonderful man. And I thought what was the coolest thing, even back when I was eight or 10 years old, that there was a green gladiolus. So there is a green flowered gladiolus, which I think is so fun because we just like blue. We don't have a lot of blue flowers. So having this green flowered plant was such a, such a thrill. So this is a spike plant, very upright in the garden. And if you don't have a lot of space, gladiolus is a perfect plant for you because they don't take up much room. Every color of the rainbow is available, so you could go to town and plant whatever color you want. They even have some that are bicolored as well. The corms don't need to be planted too deep, just about three inches into the ground, and you'll do this once the soils have warmed. So I would say probably at least in the mid-50s before you decide to plant your gladiolus, and then plant them in rows that are six inches apart. So this is really a production plant, but you could add them randomly throughout your perennial garden just for a little bit of height. They're great for the back of the border too, because again, they reach about three to four feet tall, maybe two to three feet tall, depending on how well you water. You'll want to harvest when the two bottom flowers are starting to open. So they're going to bloom up the stem. So once those two bottom flowers are open, that's when you're going to harvest and then use them as a cut flower. Uh, so you'll see them in the grocery store. Sometimes you can buy them at Whole Foods or King Supers or wherever you shop. And you'll notice that they might have one or two flowers open. And then they'll generally open over a period of seven to 10 days. So a fairly long cut flower, which is really nice. If you're going to plant the gladiolus in a container, again, you can totally do this. It's going to be the same size as the other containers. So at least 12 inches deep and wide. and you'll plant them, the corms actually a little bit deeper in the container. So about four to six inches deep and then keep them two inches apart. But this is one where you could absolutely plant more than one corm per container. So you could do several and have a nice grouping of gladiolus. This is another plant that you might consider succession sowing. So find out when the bloom time is and then maybe plant some every two weeks or so, because it's nice to have these cut flowers to add to your arrangements during a long period of time, as opposed to all at once. If you don't cut the flowers, you just leave them in the garden, that's totally fine. Just don't remove the spent flower heads and then leave them in the garden until that foliage browns. This is especially important if you are going to harvest them or if you're going to overwinter the corms. Gladiolas are actually pretty inexpensive, and so it could be something that you just plant every year if you don't want to go to the effort of digging them up. So you could consider that too. But if you do plan on overwintering them and you don't cut them, leave the foliage, let it turn brown, and then that's when you can go in and dig them up. Moving on to caladiums, another amazing foliage plant. If you haven't grown caladiums, give them a try. This is one that will actually do well in shady conditions. So all of the ones we just talked about are full sun, but caladiums will do well in shady spots. So this is a great way to brighten up a north facing porch or maybe under a tree in a container, something like that. But these will give you a lot of color in a darker space. These are perfect for containers. And so you'll start to see these. Uh, a lot of times the garden centers will start them for you and then you can actually buy them and plant them. 
not at all hardy to Colorado. So this is one that definitely needs to be overwintered appropriately. The caladiums are considered to be old fashioned. It's been around for about 300 years since the 1700s. So it's a very old historic plant and we have grown them in uh, cultivation for a very long time. They again, like the cannas, have really interesting variegation to the leaves. So they have different textures and colors and patterns and stripes. And you can see here the great array of different ways that you can buy a caladium. Uh, the main colors that they come in are going to be pink, red, green, white, sometimes silver, um, and then any combination thereof. And what's really interesting is that the leaves, they are born on a petiole, which is the stem of the leaf, botanically speaking. The petioles are what's going to arise from the, the surface or from the, the base of the soil. So they don't have a stem, they have these long petioles that directly arise from the soil. The two types you might run into are the fancy leaf and the lance leaf caladiums. So the fancy leaf caladiums are very, very large leaves. I mean, we're talking about leaves themselves that could be anywhere from 12 inches long um, and maybe you know eight to 10 inches wide, very, very big. They're also going to have very long petioles. So again, if you're looking for a plant that's really interesting for cut flower production to add to bouquets or just to make a dramatic uh, finish, you could also use some caladiums, which is nice because those petioles are so long and that's really what you need in order to make those nice bouquets. The lance leaf caladiums, the leaves are going to be smaller and then the edges tend to be kind of ruffled or frilled. So they're going to be a little bit more undulating, which gives them a little bit more character. These are more compact plants, only about 12 inches tall compared to the fancy leaf, which can get much larger. And they also will have more leaves per tuber. So if you're looking for more bang for your buck, maybe consider getting the lance leaf caladium. So smaller leaves themselves, shorter plants, but you're going to get more foliage per tuber. Planting caladiums, this is what the corms look like. They're kind of funny looking and hairy. Uh, the corms need to be only a couple inches deep. And what you could do is actually start these indoors now. So in mid-April, you could start them indoors with a plan to move them outside around the beginning of June. Again, you can also buy these from a garden center that has maybe a wider selection of annuals available. Sometimes you can get caladiums there too. But if there's a special one that you want to buy, I would suggest starting them indoors from corns. Uh, you'll plant them with the pointy end up easy enough um, and keep them in a warm room until you can move them outdoors. So they don't need a lot of care. Uh, essentially, you'll just plant them in pots uh, that you then will transplant into the garden or into containers, but just monitor the water. Don't let them get too dry. Don't let them get too wet. And again, keep them indoors until it's well after freezing. So I would say June 1 at the very minimum, if you're higher in elevation, you might be at June 15th or beyond. And then make sure you're hardening them off. And that just means that you're putting them outside for a few hours, bringing them in, and you're acclimating them to the outdoor conditions. Because if you take them straight from your home and you put them in the garden, uh, they're not going to do well. There's, there's going to be drama involved, which you don't need. A couple cultivars that you could consider. So there's again, a wide variety of looks. If you're doing more of a moon garden with the silvers and whites, white Christmas would be an absolutely great addition. If you want something that's a little bit brighter, rosebud will, fit the bill. Uh, but again, these are just four examples. There's so many more others out there available for purchase. Tuberous begonias, these are ones that you have probably grown as an annual. Uh, you can also start them inside very, very easily, especially if there's certain varieties that you want to grow. So tuberous begonias are great. Again, another plant that comes in every color of the rainbow in terms of flowers, and they almost look like miniature carnations or roses. So these are another shade loving plant. So like our caladiums, our tuberous begonias are great for shady spots. And they aren't hardy, but you can either try to overwinter them or grow them as a house plant inside with 
probably some adjustments as well. But again, they would be fine to be grown as an annual, which I think is how we usually grow most begonias. Uh, the flowers can be red, orange, salmon, white, bicolored, double, single. So there's a lot of variation. What's nice about the tuberous begonias is that the foliage tends to be a really dark green color. And so it tends to make that color of the flower really pop. So if you get one that's yellow with that dark green, that's just really going to set things off or white or red, or in this case, I think this looks exactly like a carnation, which is really pretty fun. Uh, the petals may have margins or crests or blotches of color. There's been a lot of breeding with tuberous begonias. If you make it up to Fort Collins sometime during the summer, do stop by the CSU annuals and they have a whole shade structure of plants that always includes tuberous begonias. And you'd probably be amazed at the huge variation in begonias and what's gone into breeding in recent years. It's, it's not your standard uh, begonias that you may remember from childhood. There's a lot of really interesting textures and colors that have come onto the market. If you want to plant your tuberous begonias, again, you could start that now-ish. Um, so you could get them from garden centers. They are a tuber and they kind of look like a clod of soil. They're not very interesting. They'll have a shallow indent on the top of the tuber. Uh, so hopefully you can feel that. And if you make a mistake and plant it upside down or the plant will figure it out, I promise. It might take it a little bit longer, but it will figure it out. So you can start these in March or April, and the sooner you plant them indoors, the sooner they'll be ready to go outside or the sooner they'll bloom. So a February start, we're obviously past that time. They'll bloom generally in June. If you start them now-ish, they're going to bloom in July. Or again, you can buy already potted begonias available in garden centers too. You don't need to do it from tubers. Uh, if you do want to do it from tubers just for fun, plant the tubers in a flat of peat moss or vermiculite. Uh, that's that gold flecked stuff. Um, peat moss, of course, I think most of you know, it's kind of like a shredded dusty material. So you'll just plant them in a flat, keep the hollow side of the tuber up, um, and then you'll just cover them lightly with peat moss or vermiculite. So I have a photograph of what they'll look like. Uh, this is again, just a shallow flat. Um, so something more shallow, not very deep. Um, and you'll just really just barely cover them with the potting media on top or the vermiculite or perlite or peat moss, excuse me. Uh, keep them fairly moist, but not wet. So it's that Goldilocks approach to getting them going. Keep them moist, but not too wet. And just make sure that when you water that, that hollow in the tuber doesn't co collect any sort of water. They do need warmer temperatures. So if you have a heat mat or something like that where they would get warmer temperatures, my house never gets to be 70 degrees unless it's August. So this is not a good one for a cold house, but they do need warmer temperatures in order to germinate. Then you would take them, you would repot them into containers or let them grow. And then at that point, plant them outside once the chance of frost is passed. Again, like our other friends, you do want to harden them off to make sure that they're not shocked once they go outside and have to experience Colorado Spring. Any questions before I get into fall care in the last few minutes? How do you get tuberous begonias to break dormancy? To break dormancy? Oh my goodness, I don't know. Um, I would think that, I don't know, if, they, if they're stored properly in the right conditions, I don't know if they need, I don't think they need like a scarification or a stratification period. Um, but Tony or Cassie, if you want to work on that question and then bring it back at the end, that would be appreciated because that one's, that one's a stumper. Good question. Yes, indeed. Okay, so fall care of bulbs. Again, I've mentioned this a couple times that for the most part, these are not hardy to Colorado with the exception of the lilies. So these are plants that are going to need extra care in the fall. And that might just make you tired. I don't know. I, I know that in the fall, I'm pretty burned out. I'm not really interested in continuing gardening. 
Uh, but you can overwinter these successfully if you do some extra work. Um, or again, you can always treat them as annuals. And that just means you grow them for the one season and then you plant new ones that you purchase the next year. There is no shame in doing that. I have done both. So if you do want to overwinter these in the fall, you're going to cut the foliage back to about six inches above the ground. So as we get into the fall, we're getting some cooler temperatures. The plants are going to start to look ragged and kind of gross. And that's when you can actually cut them back to about six inches, but don't cut them all the way down. Do leave a little bit of height on those stems. And then you're going to dig them, okay? So that means that you'll have to get out and trowel them out and work the soil. So using a spray, a spade or a trowel, or maybe even a steel tine pitchfork, you'll work your way around the bulb to loosen the soil. So it's a, much like if you're digging garlic or potatoes, you'll want to kind of work around them, but don't stab the bulb. That is a big thing. And this is where I get very careless and I have stabbed so many bulbs in my life that then I just get frustrated. So keep it outside the area, wiggle it back and forth to try to loosen the soil and then gently lift the entire clump of plant from the ground. And then you can start to get the soil off of the bulb itself. This is so important. If you were good and you labeled everything going into the spring, make sure that as soon as you lift them, you are labeling them as well. So some of the bulbs like the dahlias, this is dahlia, you could actually write on the tubers themselves what variety it is. If you don't care that much, you don't have to do this step or take a plant tag and stick it in with those so that it travels and you can identify them because all the dahlia tubers look the same, all the gladiolus corms look the same. And this is a big thing if you want to keep track of what you actually planted. Then you need to let the bulbs cure. And this could be hours to weeks, depending on the species. And this is where I would really recommend that you're doing some additional research in the fall to know how to exactly care for your bulbs. This is a very general talk and we can't really go into that great of detail. But you're letting them cure by placing them either on a screen or in this case, this is hardware cloth. You just want to make sure they're not sitting directly on concrete or soil or anything like that because that can actually lead to an improper cure which won't allow them to overwinter successfully. So you need that good airflow around the plant. Um, don't cure them in sunlight. So bring them into a cool dark place like a garage or um, a crawl space, if you have that unheated basement would work really well, but find a space that's at least out of direct sunlight. General storage tips is you're going to pack them loosely together in some sort of box. Uh, and you can use any sort of packing material, whether that's peat moss, whether it's sand, vermiculite, shredded paper. If you're shredding documents, you could save that and use that to pack your bulbs this fall. Uh, you could use wood shavings, whatever you have on hand. Just keep in mind that whatever you're using has to be lightweight and it has to be very airy and you're not going to put a lot of bulbs into a container. You're going to have a lot more packing material than bulbs. You don't want the bulbs touching each other and you do need to have good air circulation. Leave the box uncovered. So I know that some people might be using those big plastic storage bins. Absolutely fine to use, but just don't put the lid on them. Make sure that you're leaving them open because if they're not fully cured or they have any sort of moisture, that moisture can build up and then you have a rotting icky mess by the end of the winter. So do make sure that you're allowing them plenty of airspace. Um, also, they will dehydrate down. That's just Colorado. We're such a dry climate that they're going to shrink and shrivel. If they're getting too shriveled, you might want to spritz them. So take them out, spritz them, add some moisture, leave them out so that the moisture dries and then pack them up again. So it does get to be a lot. I get it. But again, it's a step. And if you have varieties that you want to grow year after year, or you invest in hundreds of dollars worth of summer blooming bulbs, it is a good step to take. Uh, the correct storage temperature should be somewhere between 35 and 45 degrees with about 50% relative humidity. I don't know where in the winter we have relative humidity of 50%, uh, but maybe you'll find that spot in your home. 
uh, just be aware that that's the ideal temperatures. You do want to keep them from freezing and you don't want them to get any warmer than about 45 degrees. So an unfinished heated, unheated basement is great. Um, if you have a garage that doesn't freeze during the winter, that could work. Um, if you have the blessing of a root cellar, that's going to be a perfect location. And then do, again, check them during the winter, making sure that you're um, feeling them to make sure that they're not mushy, that you, if you do have any mushy ones or ones that are starting to get moldy, that you're throwing those away because mold can spread really, really easily. And again, you might need to spritz them to keep them more hydrated. So a little bit of specifics on dahlias. You will dig them before a hard freeze. A hard freeze is around 28 degrees, 26 to 28 degrees. So a light freeze is fine. If we get a 30, 32 degree freeze comes in, kills the tops, no big deal. You do want to dig them before a hard freeze. So sometimes we're in a panic of when that is uh, and just know that fall is a busy time because we're harvesting everything if we're going to have a hard freeze. The tuberous roots can really break easily. So just handle with care. They're very fragile. They'll break apart, they'll break in half and you do want to leave them as intact and whole as possible. Let them cure for maybe a half a day before packing them up for storage and then check monthly for dehydration. So one year I did overwinter my dahlias. I dug them up. I was all excited and I forgot about them. I never checked them during those winter months. And the next spring I brought them out all excited and they had shriveled to essentially nothing. It was horrible. <laughs> so lesson learned, you do need to check them and add some moisture if necessary. And a lot of people do divide in the fall. You can divide them in the spring too. Uh, you'll throw away the original mother tuber. You'll know who she is because she's usually shriveled and kind of ugly. And then you will want to keep at least a couple eyes uh, for your new ones for next year. Now there are amazing videos and great tutorials on how to divide your dahlias. And I would suggest that you watch those so you have a really good idea of how to do it and what to look for. Your cannas, again, like your dahlias, you can allow a frost to kill the tops, but again, get them out of the ground before a hard freeze. You're going to let the roots dry for at least a day or two, or maybe a half a week. So curing is a little bit longer than the dahlias. And then you can clean the roots um, by just kind of rubbing off the soil with your fingers. That is going to be the easiest thing. For the most part, we don't want to dip any of these in water because again, that moisture can lead to problems. So just try to rub off any of the extra soil or potting media that you might have. And then do wait to divide your cannas until spring and then make sure that there are at least three eyes per division uh, on the canna so that you have enough potential for them to grow that season. So gladiolus, we talked about a little bit that it's up to you to decide if it's worth it to dig your gladiolus or just to treat them as annuals. Uh, you'll lift the plants in the fall when the plants either yellow. So you'll know when they start to yellow, that's going to be probably in late September, maybe a little bit into October or after the first frost. Shake off the soil, do not wash them off and then cut the stems to about two inches and then let them dry again using the techniques mentioned above. You can remove the old shriveled corn. So here's the old shriveled corn. That was the plant that grew and flowered that season. And then it will of course produce another corn, which is what's going to flower the following season for you. So you can actually just snap that old corn off and then that's how you would store it. You can do that in the fall or you could do that in the spring before planting. Our caladiums are not very cold tolerant at all. And so these are plants that you should start thinking about overwintering before we get those cold temperatures. So they're pretty wimpy. They're kind of babies when it comes to the freezing temperatures. So lift them before frost and allow them to dry in a warm spot for about a week. So a fairly long curing period. Um, you can cut back the foliage when it turns yellow. And then these are ones that need to be stored at a warmer temperature. So 60 degrees is the minimum for these plants. Again, they're just not as tolerant. The others were 30 to 40 degrees. These will need to be at a temperature of 60. So in my house, that would be the middle of the kitchen. 
And then storing your tuberous begonias, dig before a hard frost, another one that is completely intolerant of the cold temperatures that come in and allow the tubers to cure for a couple weeks with some of the foliage still intact. Let them cure with the foliage, then you can cut the foliage down and store at 50 degrees for the winter. My final tips as we wrap up this talk, if it's too much work, I've mentioned this, just treat them as annuals, that's totally fine. You can add just a few bulbs to your garden this summer, see how you like it, see how successful it is. And then you can just consider them an expensive-ish annual, which is okay. Uh, buying bulk is going to be cheaper. So maybe you and a neighbor or a family member could get together and you put in a bulk order that will help save the cost for you. And then just try something new, you know, really try to challenge yourself with something new. Lily of the Nile or the Agapanthus is one I didn't talk about, but these are great very common in California and other places. That's that beautiful kind of periwinkle blue that a lot of you might be looking for, but a great container plant. And there's just so much variation out there. So hopefully this has inspired you to get out and garden. So with that, happy planting. My email address is there, but I'm happy to take any additional questions at this time.